right. Uh, now, uh, the first formal session of uh, the seminar is going to start. We are having uh, Sanjeev Sahab here for his presentation. Yeah, I think Sanjeev Sahab doesn't require any introduction, but just uh, like uh, he has more than 36 years of uh, commercial banking experience, and then he has been uh, given the task of central bank governor, so he's already working in that capacity. So he has a point of view on, uh, from the board side, from the commercial banking side, and, and the central banking side. So from the regulator's point of view, and the commercial bank's point of view. So we are going to have, uh, he's going to present uh, on the progression and the progression of Panchi Kalan, who died and who fixed it. If I make the right impression, he's adjunct professor of IEA Karachi. Yes, the right My mistake. My mistake. He is. And also, Sadiq Sayyid is also the adjunct yeah. yeah. professor. We should get the right introduction. Okay. 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 It's a pleasure to be here today and very nice to have Dr. Ishad open this. Uh, I've had the opportunity to be visiting uh, the IBA several times, never had the opportunity to see Dr. Ishad Sassan attend anything that I've, uh, I'm doing, so it is, it is a pleasure and I welcome you all. <coughs> I'm, my subject really is, uh, it's causation in financial crisis. And then progression, <laughs> now, how the pieces are picked up afterwards. Uh, you know, there is no easy answer. The, in, all, in all the three deepest crises we've had in modern times, the Great Depression, Japan, last decade, and whatever this is, the Great Recession, the Great Contraction, or whatever shape it might take, <coughs> uh, the common factor was huge financial overheating in the beginning and then a crash, vibrations. Now after you enter the crisis stage in each of these three, so the similarity, there were still similarities and differences, but Mr. Sayyid was just asking the question, you know, what have we learned? It's very difficult to say what we've learned. The, the Great Depression, <coughs> the severity of the Great Depression, as I said, financial overheating, yes, was common to all. But the severity of the Great Depression came because for four years, the financial authorities did not act while banks collapsed. So demand collapsed by about 30%, money supply. And uh, of course, the economy went into a downward spiral. But for four years, partly because of this belief in the self-creation of markets, and partly because of the straitjacket that the gold standard put you into in terms of monetary expansion, the effect of that on uh, your trade, and therefore, <coughs> on, on uh, then having to shrink the economy further, the straight jacket of the gold standard, but also a lot of faith that the market would self-adjust, which I think we carried forward that faith now, you know, seven to eight years later into the present crisis. Anyway, Japan did act quickly. So in the US for four years, 19, uh, 1912, 93 years, 1929 to 32, till, till Roosevelt came over, no action by uh, uh, financial authorities. Japan, they went into action immediately. In the, uh, in the early, well, in 89, actually, as, as the overheating in the stock market and the property markets took hold. They went into action immediately, but there were rigidities in, in, the, in Japan's economic and corporate frameworks and in Japan's financial system, the cross-holding, the fact that there was really no uh, oversight of banks because they tended to be owned by mutual insurance companies which really had no shareholders. The reasons why Japan ended up with banks with, with loans not being written off, balance sheets not being cleaned, so zombie companies and zombie banks. Well, that eventually was sorted out, but then you had the Asian crisis, the recovery, uh, Japan recovered from there, and perhaps Japan's now in its second, second last decade because they've lost, uh, they had more uh, shrink, economic shrinkage post uh, 2008 and 2009 than they had in the 90s. Uh, they find their way about it, they're around it. They're a, they're a strong, uh, resilient economy. In Japan, basically, the debt might be 200 
over 200 percent GDP in an effort to revive the economy. But they've got huge, uh, Japanese corporations have huge uh, foreign assets. And Japan's net debt, if you take out the surpluses of, of Japanese government, is much less than the two twenty is talked about. However, in, in, in the first case, an expectation that the market would clear all didn't work. In the second case, the expectation that you know, early intervention, injection of liquidity would sort things out really didn't work. <clears throat> What's happening this time? We've seen governments act, act immediately. Ben Bernanke did his PhD thesis on the Great Depression, and in particular on debt deflation as a factor that prolongs prices. In other words, if demand collapses to a point where, and banks take over, uh, or close on loans, and banks start selling collateral, companies start closing, asset values start falling. Debt, therefore, if asset values are collapsing at 10% a year, your debt is going up at 10% a year. And inflation is flat, when inflation is 1%, because there's no demand. Uh, your debt, and, and when your debt starts going up, you get into a negative spiral of lack of demand, lack of investment, more unemployment, more lack of demand. That is difficult to pay. So he learned all those lessons, and he acted very, very quickly. Um, between him, between the US and Europe, <coughs> um, through investment in banks, through insurance of banks' assets, through swaps of, uh, of bad assets with banks, uh, through injections of liquidity, all these programs together were in trillions of dollars. Uh, what's happening? Uh, the world economy has definitely, you know, the, the rate of growth has fallen. But are we better off? Are, are things looking more positive now than they were three years ago? In other words, is this uh, the end of the beginning, or are we still not at the beginning of the end? We don't know. And that's not because uh, of what the markets can and cannot do. It's because of the, you know, this interconnected, interconnected global world <coughs> where uh, political and social issues get very badly trammeled with, uh, with the pure economic issues. The market can't act, uncertainty takes over. So the growth, uh, the growth forecast for this year, uh, Europe is going to shrink half a percent. America will grow 2%, but I just saw some Morgan Stanley forecast. It's going to grow 2% this year, but 1.4% next year. Uh, huge liquidity, but it's all backing up. Ma uh, back, uh, governments are pumping in liquidity you know, through central bank balance sheets being expanded, through uh, <coughs> treasury routes. But that liquidity is all coming back into, into banks, uh, in, into government, into government paper. It is not going out to generate investment. Investment and consumption are flat and at low levels, in fact, falling. And the third is uh, that huge poison parcel of bad debt, whatever the volume is, is still there. You know, it's, the parcel is being moved around, but it hasn't been blown up, it hasn't been written off, and banks, the, the, the whole system still has a lot of bad debt in it, except it's passed from private hands to the sovereign. And hence, because as government, as the Irish government took over Irish bad, uh, bad Irish debt, as the Spanish government took over bad Spanish debt, as uh, the UK, which did less of that, it more, the UK did more direct injection into equity, and when it did take over bad debt, uh, it just took it over its uh, Northern Rock. It didn't restructure, it didn't pass it back into the, into the market. It actually put money in. So I can't say really, uh, you know, which way we're headed, but. Uh, but that's, I think, the cause of the point of why we are first, why we're here today. Let's 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 think about it. Now, crises proceed from a breakdown in understanding between central banks, the financial authorities, central banks and regulators on the one side, and uh, financial markets, financial intermediaries. Essentially, mutual expectations diverge, and you don't know this till markets have overextended increased leverage, pushed up asset prices beyond economic value. Uh, and then you get to a stage where market self-adjustment is not possible. This business of the market will clear. It's not possible without a collapse of the banking system. Now, at that stage, there is not much that the central bank can do. Because if demands collapse, you can lower the interest rate to whatever you like. You know, nothing is going to twitch. There's going to be no action. Monetary policy tends to become ineffective and the responsibility then for stimulating consumption, stimulating investment, stimulating demand, 
is fiscal action. You've actually got to put, fly helicopters with cash, put money into people's pockets, and see if that works. Uh, what do crises stem from? Macroeconomic balances that expand market liquidity, expand money supply. Then the banking multiplier augments that. Increased banking leverage comes into play, stoking effective demand, which, uh, you know, this monetary demand against a, a pool of uh, real assets that's not growing at fast, obviously pushes up, pumps up the value of real assets. Central banks sit on the fence. It's not very easy for central banks to judge, even if they're seeing, and you know, Mr. Greenspan has been skewed uh, you know, over the course uh, several times over this for not acting to clamp down on, on real asset uh, expansion. It's not very easy to act. You can see overheating in the market, but if there's still an output gap, in other words, if all the ways in which you measure industrial capacity that can become operative in the short term, if there's still uh, an output gap, if there's still unemployment, then this monetary expansion might be, or this overheating might be a good thing because it might kickstart, it might bring in more capacity to play. You don't know exactly where you stand, so you hesitate to act. The overheating gets out of control, you then do act, and you probably overkill. Uh, who knows? Who knows what the right? Mr. Greenspan brought interest rates down from about 6% in 2000 to 1% by the end of 2002, early 2003. By the end of 2004, he was taking them back again, and in 2005, he took them back up to 6%. All these ninjas, the no income, no job uh, uh, borrowers of, of, of subprime loans, uh, um, all these adjustable rate mortgages where interest was postponed. You needn't pay interest because your property value was rising faster than interest, so interest was postponed for two years. <coughs> and then the interest you paid would be adjusted to what the rates were at the time. Now, all these loans were made in an environment of 1, 2, and 3 percent uh, interest rates. When interest became due, interest rates were 6 percent, 7 percent, the bank's margins increased because when risk increases, banks, the bank spread. It's not just the cost of funds, banks uh, increase their spread. And these loans became unserviceable. So there were a lot of the bank loans could not never have been serviced because they were given to, uh, you know, uncreditworthy, an uh, uncreditworthy segment of the, of the market. But a lot could have been serviced. Anyway, the good got thrown out of the bag and you had full-fledged uh, asset, real asset prices. Now, so SAR assets are dumped and assets by value scores, which is the process I've been through. The, the issue is, once, would you say the market is clear today? You know, who knows? If you left it to the market, the market understands risk. The market could act of itself. But the, the political and social ramifications that this crisis has generated and the global interconnectedness of you know, the, the big economic blocks of the world uh, sort of paralyze you because you depend on a lot of decisions by, and I, we'll look at this uh, a little later in, in my presentation. You, you depend on uh, the actions by a, a lot of regulators, financial authorities, societies, <laughs> governments. Is Merkel going to save the euro? Is, is uh, <clears throat> the fiscal union going to come about uh, in, the, um, in the European Union? Is, pre, is Brexit going to happen? Is Greece going to be? So I mean, all these things postpone what's going to happen to the welfare state. Is it affordable? Can, can Europe carry the present welfare state at the present rate of tax or are taxes going to go up? How is labor going to react uh, all across Europe with unemployment, average European unemployment of 10%, as high as 25% in the southern periphery? Youth unemployment, they say, Spain, Greece, Italy, well, Spain and Greece, Italy is not that bad, uh, pushing 50%. So what do you do in this environment as, a, as an investor? Where do you invest? How much do you put in? What turning points do you expect? When do you expect demand to revive? So it's not the risk. It's the atmosphere of uncertainty then that box us down. Now, are banks guilty? They're not the guilty of the original sin. The original sin is not recognizing an imbalance at, as is the request. They're recognizing an imbalance but misunderstanding its role and not acting at a time when its accumulator effect uh, could be brought under control, but you'll never get that right. Nobody can. It's, it's, it's not possible. So, banks didn't create the original sin. It happened from actions of sins of omission and commission uh, from, of the financial side. But certainly, what banks are guilty of uh, is a herd instinct. They, you know, they're all in the same direction, 
accumulating mass and, and uh, uh, you know, building assets uh, at a huge pace. And then when the contagion starts, you know, the, the, the reverse trend, uh, stampede of the herd is similar. You know, contagion starts, values are just shredded, things are dumped, things are sold. Interconnected models, you can't help it. You know, they, they, you will force selling to a point where, uh, you know, the, the value is destroyed. And as banks, then you're taught, you're taught as a banker, you know, never panic. You panic, make sure you panic first. But then everyone panics first. Just to run through uh, some illustrations of the uh, of the three great financial crises. Uh, the Great Depression, there are still being uh, books being written about. There have probably been more books written about the Great Depression than any other aspect of uh, economics uh, in the world. So, I mean, variety of sources, you can disagree. Yeah. Are you a Hayekian? Are you an Austrian? Are you a Friedmanite? Are you a monetary? Uh, are, you, so, are you Krugman and Keynesian? People will have their uh, you know, reasons for what was the most important factor. You know, what came first? What came afterwards? But nobody disagrees that the severity of, so, so the, 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 let's leave the origins aside, but the severity of the depression had most to do with the bank failures that I talked about. Uh, 9,000 banks crashed, one third of the US banking system. In, in a, you know, over the, the first two, three years of the crisis, uh, money supply shrank, that of course, uh, you know, slaughtered demand, debt deflation, which I referred to, and Fed did nothing like to raise QE, and uh, GDP fell 45%, unemployment rose to 25%, but the market didn't clear. This business of, you know, things have got to rock bottom, now the stronger will pick up the weaker uh, and start going again, employment will rise, virtuous effect growth. It just didn't happen. And fiscal act, uh, Roosevelt's uh, first act were all to do with raising the, the, uh, the budget deficit hugely to finance employment and then bring demand back into the economy uh, through, through uh, a huge scale of public works, some of which was very useful, like the Tennessee Valley Authority, some of which was useless, like, uh, you know, four million people in uh, employed in park conservation across the states. But again, the idea was simply to put cash into people's pockets, because it wasn't happening from the productive economy side. And it did work. You can argue about whether America ever got out of the depression. There's a big argument, you know, how long was the depression? Were the first few years of Roosevelt the end of the depression or not really? Was it, was it really the Second World War? Because America did dip again in 38, 39. Growth fell again sharply. The unemployment, by the way, did not come down below 14% throughout Roosevelt's uh, career. Oh, no, no, his career went down to 45 and throughout all the time until the Second World War. And then it, the Second World War, so anyway, when did, how did America come out of the recession? Uh, we don't know. It was Roosevelt right, did that? The deficits weren't very big, 6%. And today Obama has a deficit of 10. Roosevelt's peak deficit was 6. America tended to run, budgets were surplus, or budgets were flat. That was the philosophy. There have always been, if the rank deficit would be 1 or 2%, then they run 1 or 2% surplus. Now Roosevelt went up to 6%. It did make a change, but then he started bringing uh, the, the deficit down. The Americans didn't like deficits. Uh, they'd rather tax cuts creating employment and lower deficits, then higher expenditure, uh, which would require higher taxes. They, you know, that's, even today, that's the debate <laughs> between Romney Ryan on the one side and the Democrats on the other. The Japanese uh, lost decade. Private monetary, monetary expansion, interest rates was uh, between 86 and 88. Interest rates brought down to 6 to 3%. Uh, unsustainable spiral in property and stock prices. Other factors were partly financial deregulation. Yes, the, the Americans had arrived in, in, in uh, Tokyo and the Americans had uh, linked, begun to link uh, corporates with public markets. Uh, until then, Japan had been primarily a uh, market like Pakistan, prim primarily, primarily uh, a banking market. Uh, companies did not borrow from through bond structures and commercial payments significantly, but they started doing that uh, in the early 90s or late 80s, early 90s. <coughs> As a result, banks had a lot of cash, very happy to lend to the stock uh, to people financing the stock market, very happy to lend to real estate. So interest rates were coming down, and banks were moving 
the, the asset direction is big corporations began to use public markets, banks had spare cash. So, you know, that was another factor. Financial deregulation helping uh, the spiral in profit stock prices. Now, the other sad thing, there's a book by an ex-Japanese finance minister, which I read in the early 90s, a Japan that can say no. And and what <clears throat> what he meant was that we've had to revalue, the yen has had to revalue beyond any logical proportion. The, the Plaza Accord was an agreement between America on the one side and Britain, uh, Germany, and Japan on the other. Because America had very high interest rates in the early 80s, this was Mr. Boker killing inflation. As a result, the, the yen had, uh, the dollar had depreciated. And he wanted the dollar down. So the way to get the dollar down was to get these other currencies up. Anyway, the yen and the Japanese took that very seriously. And over, <coughs> uh, over four years, the yen strengthened from 250 to 125 yen to a dollar. Now, Japanese who've been investing abroad uh, you know, was a disaster to them. Whatever they made, they might have made 10% more in uh, earning-wise in, in, in dollars. But when they brought that back, the, valuation, the revaluation of the yen wiped them out. So the Japanese, had, <coughs> in that period, the corporate sector did what it had to do. It had to have foreign balances, it kept foreign balances. But the private sector transferred, individual, the rich Japanese or the Japanese saver, transferred uh, investments from old foreign currencies into yen because of this uh, currency effect of, of the appreciating yen. And, and the yen, the, 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 the financial minister's book, the Japan that Kim was precisely on this point, that, we, that, that this crisis we've got, we've shot ourselves in the foot and that's the reason. Whether it's right or not isn't the point. But that was a perception. Then they did raise interest rates after this overheating, prices crashed, and I already mentioned this, the length of recession was over, uh, you know, partly to the reluctance of Japanese authorities to force loan write downs in banks so that you had these zombie companies and uh, zombie banks. All right, now you look at those two, neither the sort of creative destruction that happened in America, and it was creative destruction. You know, this, this, you know, liquidate, 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 let banks collapse, the stronger will emerge. That didn't work, and it seems the Japanese expectation of a gentler uh, recovery, market recovery, supported by fiscal intervention, you know, has that worked effectively? Well, it's worked, but how effectively? Uh, and what is the proper answer to the Japanese ailment? Maybe, you know, the Japanese are out of it, but there's an increasing talk. Uh, that they're not, and which makes the U.S. worry about how long their recession might be. Now, let's look at the U.S. Uh, crisis of 2007. Uh, we were talking about imbalances. The U.S. between uh, uh, 2001 and 2004, as I mentioned to you, followed a policy of huge monetary easing and low interest rates. The underlying cause was global trading, traded, uh, uh, trade imbalances. The U.S. ran high current account deficits. But the, so the dollar should have come under pressure. Interest rates uh, should have had to go up. Inflation should have gone up. But none of that happened. And the reason was that all the trade surpluses that people ran with America and that they ran with the rest of the world, not just uh, this, uh, the, uh, what was due to them from America, but their surpluses built up through other trade ended up in U.S. fisheries. The U.S. dollar is still about 63-64% of the global reserve picture of central banks. So when China ran surpluses, it didn't just put back the surplus of America, whatever it is, 250-300 billion dollars a year. It also put into American treasuries surpluses with other countries. As a result, U.S. liquidity expanded. Now, inflation was low because, because the uh, transfer from Europe and from internal America of a lot of consumer goods and light electricals, the transfer of uh, those products from uh, being made in, in the developed markets to the emerging markets meant a much sharper fall in price of those products. That was one, the strong dollar and the, the, uh, the, 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 the low cost goods coming in from the emerging markets kept US inflation very low. Now, Mr. Greenspan believed that the, you know, in the market's view, inflation expectations are now anchored. 
And we, I, I remember reading about this at the time, we kept attributing this to innovation and to higher productivity. And, you know, it had been called <coughs> the oracle for a long time, but this was another one of those mysterious things, because people said, what exactly? And it's elaborate. You keep talking about, this time we're not going to see uh, inflation, it's dead forever, because the U.S. economy has reached a level of productivity where it does not need much more capital to make a lot more, and the goods will be sharper, smarter, at stable prices. He, he, he didn't uh, appreciate at the time that this stability in American prices and stability in the exchange rate really was because of the, the new role of emerging balances, both in, in the prices of goods in the market and in how their reserve surpluses supported the dollar. So he continually, so whenever the U.S. looked like growth was slowing, Mr. Greenspan would cut interest rates. They did it after the Nasdaq crash, after 9-11, and he did it through the 90s, after the savings and loan prices of 89 and 90, and then the real estate prices of commercial banks in 91 and 92. It came to, that process came to be known as the Greenspan put. So when Mr. Sadiq Zaid was talking about expect, mutual expectations, the market certainly expected the regulators to be uh, he was strongly supportive of any vibrations in the economy, uh, either through uh, you know, demand uh, or through uh, any weakness in, in the um, emergence of the, the financial structure through which the banks are dealing with the market. Uh, and, and his response to uh, real asset prices was, as I mentioned to you, that he said if consumer price inflation is low, I don't want to tackle this, uh, I don't know what the right house prices should be, and he's right. I don't know what the right stock, uh, stock market prices should be. That's for the investor to decide. As long as consumer prices are lower, I'm not going to <coughs> intervene. And then prudential rules to limit excess risk. He could have put some limits on banks. He could have uh, said, you've gone too far with these waiting agencies. You know, you go back to uh, this book to sell. In other words, booking loans to sell them, which seems to be becoming your major preoccupation. Go back to holding more. You can't sell as much. Some limits on our balance sheet, uh, the creation of our balance sheet vehicles. So he could have thought about potential loose, but that didn't happen. Uh, to cool the economy instead of raising interest rates, he could have thought of higher reserve requirements. And, and you know, again, it's a mystery why higher reserve requirements uh, were never used. And then further, uh, he was the champion for reversing Glass-Steagall. Glass-Steagall, if you remember, was uh, something that Roosevelt's administration set up as a result of bank crashes in the 1930s that arose from banks investing directly in the stock market. The stock market, as you know, collapsed from, was it 300 to 40? So over a period of uh, two years, uh, index of 300 to uh, 40. Uh, and, and banks thereafter were ring-fenced. Uh, commercial banks could not risk money in either in the stock market or in investment banking transactions. But that regulation <coughs> was overturned the charge against the regulation was led by Sandy Weil Rubin, who was Clinton's uh, uh, finance secretary, who was working with Citibank at the time. So Sandy Weil of Citibank, Rubin, and Greenspan. They actually went to, um, you know, they, they made speeches in Congress. And Graf Siegel was overturned. Uh, the same trio opposed the appointments of a derivative regulator. So the regulate, you know, derivatives are exploding. Contractuals they might be, but they were exploding, and there was no regulator. Uh, Congress mooted a bill about the appointment of a regulator. These three gentlemen uh, managed to convince the, the Houses of Congress that no such regulator was needed and a regulator wasn't appointed. Uh, they were quite happy that derivatives continue in an over-the-counter <coughs> uh, situation. Uh, market traded derivatives, which is what they're talking about now, uh, you know, as far as the view of the regulators was concerned, didn't need them. You know, the banks have modeled uh, their risk uh, perfectly. They've got you know, PhDs and ex-Nobel Prize winners setting up their financial models. They know what they're doing. Let them trade bilaterally. We don't need uh, a regulator, and we don't need a registered exchange for delivery trading. Uh, he didn't object to rules that the SEC in America changed. Uh, in 2004 that effectively allowed brokerages as part of investment banks to take their leverage up to 33 to 1 from 15 to 1 by 
looking by allowing the uh, brokerages to be consolidated with the overall balance sheet of the, uh, uh, of the bank, of the institution. Implicitly that meant that the brokerage itself, taking advantage of what was behind it, or the holding company or the uh, affiliated company, could, have, could now trade many times more uh, than, than, than it could. Now this is, a, and Mr. Greenspan didn't object to this vast increase in leverage. Now what was the market to understand from all this? In the meantime, the banking model changed, the traditional uh, credit spread culture, balance sheet culture of commercial banks, uh, now, you know, so, so uh, commercial banks used to look at size and they used to look at return on assets. But now return on capital, after Glass-Steagall was eliminated, return on capital, uh, you know, uh, Citibank competing with Morgan Stanley, competing with, you know, Lehman, competing with uh, Goldman Sachs, which never used to happen. Now you're competing with them, you're competing with them for funds, return on equity became critical, managing your share price growth uh, became critical. And with the return on capital as target, the book to hold practice increasingly supplement, uh, increasingly supplement, was increasingly supplemented by the book to sell. So you, the more assets you hold, the more capital you need. But if you can book the assets, sell it, and keep a skin and keep a spread, uh, then you get a return on capital that doesn't arise from holding the asset you have balance sheet. You've sold the asset off, but you, uh, you, you put earnings into the uh, balance sheet with no capital requirement. And then if you did hold uh, uh, these assets, you held them up balance sheet through special investment vehicles. So all these CLOs, CDOs, CDOs, etc., came into operation. And what you were really doing was gaming the, the Basel system. Obviously, compensation uh, policies reflected this focus on upfront revenue generation, which is uh, the fees associated with booking, structuring, selling off. And then we ended up with the derivative pyramid. Now, <coughs> What was happening in banks is because the market was quite happy to accept rating agencies, certify assets, AAA, WB, whatever, uh, very happy to, to get guarantees or insurance, wrappers of uh, enhancements of some kind from motor line insurers. You might have heard Rambach and MGIA, and they won't collapse now. And insurance companies, you know about, remember, Washington Mutual that the government had to take over. And the other one, AIG, was it? that had written a lot of uh, books on uh, derivatives, you know. They collapsed afterwards, but in, because the market was used to, and now this is from, speaking from my experience of being uh, in a commercial bank, uh, because if something worked, and Standard & Poor's would do this, if a more reliant insurer would guarantee, I know that our standards of underwriting became, uh, let's say, lighter. So if we had to hold the asset on the book, the origination quality would be a lot deeper. The maintenance of that loan uh, would need you know, would be have a lot of attention. You'd call on the borrower, you'd get balance sheets from him, you'd get statements. On the other hand, if you put together a book of assets and the rating agency was prepared to rate it AAA or AA or whatever, the issue simply was if you, if you put together what looked like to you was a, three, a triple B book. You went to a rating agency and you, and you said you wanted to sell this as a AA. What do I need to do? And they tell you to put up 1% more capital or 2% more capital against that in your SIB. <coughs> then they'd rate your, the senior notes that were placed out of that day. Because they rate them whatever you thought uh, you wanted uh, once you'd adjusted the capital position along the lines of what the rating agency wanted. The rating agency sample checked. Banks also bought assets from the market and then sold them to, or got them rated and then sold them off. Banks also sample checked. Uh, you, you were not originating every loan one by one and you did not examine every single loan that you sold. Nor did the rating agents. They took samples. And this was the, uh, the practice all across. Now when the regulators saw this happening, and of course they, you know, when they saw that the book to uh, hold had been replaced comprehensively by the book to sell, and uh, of course, the rating agencies, etc. The rating agencies were conflicted. So were all these monoline insurers. They were conflicted because they rated, <coughs> they were paid by the issuers. All these people who, who uh, played a role in the enhancement process were paid by the issuers. Anyway, the regulators were happy with this. Um, and if, when I said that expectations diverged, 
and understandings broke down. This is what was happening. What would banks think uh, in the light of all this encouragement given to them by, by, by the regulators? And the financial low interest rates, and the complete acceptance of um, uh, you know, the derivative model, uh, no supervision on derivatives, absolute acceptance that the book to hold had changed uh, to the book to sell. They, of course, then took the, took the horse and ran away with it. So, you know, the herd instinct, absolutely. So the, to the question about, you know, I said I talk about causality and, and progress. Uh, you know, and, and there is no doubt that, uh, <coughs> that there was huge regulatory negligence or misunderstanding. And of course, banks took advantage of it. But today, we are where we are because of the, you know, combination of uh, those two you know, not being able to work together or not being able to uh, have sufficient uh, depth of, you know, knowledge of, you know, what each other was doing to, to have prevented this. Now, where are we today? The U.S. will grow to 2.2 this year. The forecast is 1.4 next year. This is the Morgan Stanley forecast that I drove along with me. Anyway, you know, S&P is back to pre prices levels. Banks are secure for the moment, uh, but... Um, you know, not very much growth coming. The fiscal cliff is something that's going to, in America, something that's going to happen at the end of this year and early next year. This is the road, but this is $610 billion of a combination of the elimination of previous tax cuts, the Bush cuts, plus spending cuts that has, you know, has been agreed between the President and the uh, Senate. This is supposed to bring the deficit down by 4%. Uh, is it is this the right time to bring the deficit down? You're also talking about QE3 at the same time, which is the point D over there, which is the third round of quantitative easing. So if the two don't fit together, you can't go with such a sharp contraction and you really show growth. And if you go for that sharp contraction and expand liquidity, then you know what are you doing? Has that been well thought out? Yeah, you know, how do how do those two uh, reconcile? So when I say uncertainties, you know, it's issues like this. There's also the U.S. state, which is not. Uh, if you remember, Obama had a crisis, had a problem. The government had a problem about 18 months ago because the the debt ceiling comes up for review every year or every 18 months. So there's, there's some period. America is at 16.3 trillion dollars of debt, and Congress and this the previous approval given to uh, the Obama government I think expires in next February. So that has to come before Congress, and if Congress doesn't pass it, if you remember what happened the last time, America lost its rating. America fell from a triple A to a double A because of the delay in Congress approving the rollover or approving a slightly higher cash for the government, uh, debt cash. So, you know, the Congress would probably approve it this time, but it is an uncertainty. In uh, Euro, I know we're going to talk about it, so I won't dwell on this uh, at any length. Uh, Grew one and a half percent last year. This year, negative half a percent, and we're talking about zero growth next year. You know, can the is it fair to expect Spain and Italy and Greece to compete with Germany on manufactured products? In other words, is there a future for them without devaluation? Uh, you know, they block themselves. They have, these European countries are having the same problem that a lot of countries had during the gold standard. Because you can't devalue, you achieve your competitiveness by reducing your domestic wages and prices. So, <clears throat> you know, if you could devalue 20%, your goods would be 20% cheaper abroad. But you can't devalue, so you have to run your wages and prices down. You have to run your costs down by 20%. The Greece has been trying it for the last four years. You know, absolutely no chance. Uh, negative growth, austerity, uh, but not going anywhere. Spain's moving into a similar position, although Spain's a much stronger economy. Uh, and Italy is, is going nowhere. Italy's had no growth, uh, actually zero growth for the last seven or eight years. It can't manage with this exchange rate. So, you know, quite aside from the political issues, that you know, the fundamental issue in, in the European periphery is, you know, can they ever have regained competitivity uh, tied to the Euro? I mentioned, to, I mentioned this to you before, <coughs> the you know, private debt is now becoming sovereign debt. There's a circular situation operating there, and sovereign ratings are being writ written down. So Spain, which could borrow at 4% 18 months ago, now has to pay 7%. Greece can't borrow, um, or it did, I don't know, 
some critical is interested. <coughs> Italian costs are put in 5%. Uh, ultimately, ultimately, this is still the, the old debt problem that hasn't been worked out. I saw a BIS estimate, this is the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland, that Europe, Europe's average debt is now 90%, the Eurozone. It used to be 60% pre-crisis. To get to the pre-crisis debt level, Europe, Eurozone as a whole will have to run 2% budget uh, surpluses for 20 years. And this is excluding interest. So, I mean, that's not viable. So, I mean, again, if I'm talking about uncertainty, you know, the Eurozone today poses huge uncertainties. And, of course, for the emerging markets, it's, it's very simple. Um, Euro, uh, Eurozone's about 16 trillion, the US 14 and a half, so 31 trillion, which is pushing half global GDP, as Dr. Ishrat was saying. Uh, <coughs> but if that's, you know, growing at minus half a percent, or at one percent, you know, at best, uh, how are these export-driven models uh, going to perform? Can China uh, accelerate the you know, domestic demand and can it accelerate the uh, <coughs> internal uh, economy or internally focused economy? Can that happen quickly enough? Uh, Brazil, they keep talking about major uh, infrastructure expenditures to keep the economy going. Brazilian growth rates have fallen very sharply. Brazil is growing at less than 3% now. <coughs> <laughs> so they're talking about major investment expenditures to make, again, create demand and have Brazil grow stronger and not rely so much on exports, but grow on domestic consumption. Who knows? I just leave these as, as things we can possibly talk about, but there is a lot of opacity in the markets today. Beyond this, social pressures, a big, big move uh, by a lot of politicians, and you hear about this commonly in the press, Break up the big banks? I don't think they will, but because there's a lot happening. The Dodd Frank reform, Walker rules, well, which are part of the Dodd Frank reform, ring fencing in the UK, etc., of retail assets. Uh, these should be sufficient, but anyway, there is that demand, and we'll see. Uh, I've mentioned this already. Given high employment and aging populations, how will policies in developed markets reconcile these social costs of dealing with unemployment, dealing with aging populations, with market philosophy of low taxation and open capital movement? You know, when businesses move out, because Europe may have to take its tax rates up significantly. Maybe it's up to them. I don't know what they'll do, but certainly there is this pressure with aging populations. <coughs> and, you know, uh, the whole pharmaceutical industry of the world is now making, you know, old people live longer, hear better, run better. And all that means is that, you know, the cost is being passed to the next generation. What's happened in Germany is for five, at the end of the, uh, uh, Second World War, five people entered the workforce for everyone who left. So the five could support that one who left very easily, you know, social security. Today, two and a half entered. And the one who left, uh, the life expectancy at the end of the Second World War was 60, today it's 75 for males. So it lives 15 years longer. A huge drain. And you can't tax, there aren't enough people coming into the world. If you don't raise income tax and corporate tax, uh, then you can't do it through just social security taxes because you don't have enough people coming into the workforce to support this, you know, growing mountain of uh, reti retirees. Uh, so that's uh, still something uh, ahead of us. And then you know what's happening. I mean, there's, there's uh, the Europeans talk about each other like they used to, perhaps during the Second World War, the dirty Greeks, the lazy Italians, the greedy Spanish. That's what the North says. There's a very much uh, <laughs> you know, sort of sense, the sense of umbrage in Northern Europe about how they're being asked to carry the can for the undeserving. At the same time, uh, there's, there's the renewed international alignment, alignments. You know, we'll see the effect of this in the next few years. Uh, first of all, the relegation of capital from north to south, or from the developed, DM, developed markets to the emerging markets. Uh, the decay of the single superpower order, you know, you can now sense that China and Russia now speak out in international forums where they would not. Nobody wants to rock the trade board or globalization board. That's not the issue, but Russia and China will now speak out in international forums where uh, an issue concerns them. So with the first Gulf War, the second Gulf War, the invasion of Afghanistan, there's no resistance from them. But on intervention in Syria, Russia and China are putting up very strong resistance. You can't you can't take for granted anymore that the rate of uh, you know 
uh, a single arbitrator, <coughs> uh, which we've had for the last uh, 20 years, is going to work anymore. And therefore, the rivalry over trade routes and, gun, uh, and uh, oil pipelines and, you know, in search for energy, search for minerals. And Dr. Ishwet was talking about the uh, uh, recovery of Africa. And Africa is a huge recipient of, of, of Chinese investment. And Indian investment to some extent, but huge. Uh, and, you know, after the 60s, uh, 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 these economies, a lot of African economies collapsed because multinationals began leaving. Uh, and therefore, their energy minerals, uh, their, their energy uh, and their minerals and their, their commodities, you know, uh, coffee and cocoa, you just didn't have the same quality of management. Well, you're getting it back right now. You're getting it back through huge doses of investment from China at a, at a, at a much, much higher level than Africa has ever received uh, before. Uh, okay, so these are just some pressures I mentioned on the way forward. I just really look, I look quickly at Pakistan since Mr. Said mentioned Pakistan is one of the things we'll talk about. Uh, we have our own imbalances, uh, but you know, you don't mind an imbalance that's come after pleasure. So if you've consumed a lot, you end up with an imbalance that's fun. But if you hadn't consumed, you end up with an imbalance <coughs> that's pain. The government uh, last year borrowed 99% of all fresh money creation by or credit by the central bank and the banks. The average borrowing has been over 80%. It's been rising from 80% since 2008. So, you know, there's one borrower in the market today, effectively. Now, what has the government done with this increase in borrowing? It hasn't gone into dams, river, uh, bridges, uh, ports. It's gone into your billion rupee a day subsidy on power. It's gone into PSC losses. And it's gone into servicing interest. Now, the absurdity, absolute, utter, and total, and, and here I will refer to my role having been in the state bank, which is something I tried to change very, very, very hard in the government can. The government borrows it a 2 or 3% premium to Habib Bank, three months. Or well, six months. Now, what does the I mean, what, what is the investor, what is this market thing that, you know, will, will Habib Bank bail the government out or will the government bail Habib Bank out? And why are you, get, why does the government have to pay more than Habib Bank to borrow from? When that paper is absolutely liquid. So while I was at the State Bank, I created this trading, we had created this trading screen to convince corporate treasurers and everyone else would buy this paper, it's very liquid, we created this trading screen to show them that billions turned over every day. Uh, we force banks to open investor accounts. Every time you open an account, you've got an investor form with it, so that you can rig up and ask your bid to be put in at the next uh, treasury auction. And we did manage to get uh, <coughs> treasury built holdings, which are over 90% banks, or uh, government paper. We managed to get, so some, from less than 10%, we managed to get uh, uh, about 15 or 17% now held uh, outside banks. But, but that's very insufficient. So, so why is it that the government pays this premium? Because the banks buy 85% of the debt. The, the banks price the debt, the government debt, as it was. When the government has not developed other conduits, has not developed a mutual fund, a fund market. Uh, and, and this is again uh, something you know, we were trying to do very hard. A, it's another matter that the government's fiscal problem is going to go on expanding money supply and go on expanding its debt. That's bad. The fiscal the fiscal uh, rot has to stop first. But given any, any fiscal state, you cannot have this, this premium uh, that the banks have against government debt. You know, and this can change. As, as, a, as a result of all this, you know, banks are quite happy lending to the government. The exposure to government has gone up from 32% to 50% over the, over the past five years. Uh, domestic national debt has doubled. Debt servicing is now 30% of total government uh, Pakistan revenues, 60% after provincial distribution. Now, the, the central government does have a problem because all the tax upsides on agriculture, property, value on services, for example, they lie within provincial authority. But we've given the provinces 7% more in the, in the NFC award two years ago. The provinces, in fact, raised less money as a percentage of the total tax revenue last year <coughs> than they've done the year before, before they got the NFC the NFC uplift. So where do we go from here? Uh, and perhaps, you know, we can spend some time discussing this now or afterwards. 
refuse the shrinking, debt servicing is unsustainable. The mechanism for tax uh, improvement isn't in the hands of the uh, central government anymore. Uh, so, you know, these are difficult challenges. Anyway, thank you very much for such a patient hearing. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer. Specific terms like we want to uh, should monetary policy as it uh, should monetary policy react to asset price on top of uh, inflation and, and uh, growth. And and so all the is and 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 Small yeah. 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 So uh, I think before going into the discussion uh, session, I just want to give you some the theoretical uh, uh, like result that because uh, in theory so we say that there is uh, like a, a sort of asymmetric response to uh, uh, this uh, monetary policy decision that when there, there is a bubble is in the rising phase, then we should not uh, or the central bank should not react to uh, to the uh, situation. But once it's burst, then it's visible, and then you can always respond to the situation. So if this is the case, then when uh, this like uh, uh, when to decide that this is the time for central banks intervention. You could, you could have saved the world. So you would have saved the world about two percent of GDP growth for the last five years if 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 people could get that phase right. That this is where things are slipping. You see. The, the British uh, Bank of England has one mandate, target interest rates and one instrument, the interest rate. Target inflation and one instrument, the interest rate. America <coughs> is not only, uh, well, America has the same general mandate, but in America they just, they're not looking at only inflation, they're also looking at the output gap. The output gap, as I mentioned to you, is the spare capacity, and the uh, degree of unemployment. Now, during Greek spans, yes, whenever we lowered interest rates, the complaint in America was, you know, we keep growing, we, we're supposed to be having, you know, we're supposed to be growing at three and four percent, but this is a jobless recovery because American unemployment stayed high, it did stay high, because the jobs are migrating to China and the jobs are migrating to emerging markets. And that's why the, uh, unemployment was high. And now, Greenspan saw that and he said, fine, you know, there is overheating, fine, there is excess money, yes. But uh, it'll all come into the flow. If your house is worth more, you'll spend more. If you're spending more, because industry has capacity, they'll produce more. Uh, the unemployed will get employed, we're okay. Uh, you know, that's the issue. And then, you know, where, where you move beyond the point, it is very, very difficult to judge. So, like, uh, this uh, uh, bubble is sort of like, it's a dynamic process. So, when, like, it's, it's going to, like, in the gay span, when it starts happening, so at the start, they would think, okay, it's because we do good than uh, otherwise expected. So, but the point is, when the bubble bursts, then the negative side of this whole thing starts looking. And nobody knows that when it's going to burst. So this specific point that, okay, this is the point that, uh, that the central bank should intervene because now it is going to burst. I think this is the main uh, problem that we do not understand as uh, like the students of uh, this uh, economics. That how the central bank should decide, okay, this is the point that who, who can decide? Now, why are you calling it a bubble? It's a correction, perhaps. I mean, if the stock markets, you know, the PE has gone up from 14 to 18, and the you know the historic average is say 16, probably even say it's only slightly over. What does it matter that it's climbed so much? Is it a bubble? If the investor uh, is prepared to, <coughs> if he believes that you know the total return from stocks match the, you know match the trend of the market, so he can invest. He can. So uh, the central bank can't decide what the right level of the stock market is. The central bank can't decide what housing, what the housing market is. What the central bank could have done, and this is what I said, they could have looked at the quality of assets being raised. They could have gone to these banks that used to book to hold and started selling. They could have examined the process they were doing. They could look at this, this business of sample instead of individual uh, uh, checking of loans. And they could have checked the rot there. Check. I don't know if it would have made a colossal difference. 
uh, that's what they would have done. But to use the, you know, the inflation wasn't there, and so if if, if uh, this man raised interest rates, his fear was it's going to have asymmetrical uh, outcomes, unintended consequences. Uh, you know, the market will take care of itself, and the banks have models, the banks are safe. Now I think that uh, of course open for questions, please introduce yourself first and then Good afternoon, sir. My name is Rahman. I am an independent consultant. I have about 20 questions, but I'll restrain myself for four. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, one. <laughs> <laughs> so my first question is that uh, we talk about the financial regulators in the US and the... I have to see if you have four lectures, then we're going to have a problem. You know, four questions I'll be able to take. I have four. Questions. Okay. Yes, they are specific. The first thing is, financial regulators in Canada, Europe, yeah. Asia, were able to better manage this. Not Europe. You, to some extent, better than US. You're, 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 all right, I'll, let me answer that question. It, because it's been, it's been posed very, I mean, it's been, it's, it's been pointed out many times. Canada and Australia came out smelling like roses, right? And Canada sits on top of Medicare. And why didn't the Canadians spend it? Very, very simple. On housing loans, they said you cannot lend to a house at more than 60% margin. Absolutely. So it's $100 house, you put 60 up. What was happening here in America was you could lend $100 against a $100 value in the anticipation that the house would be worth 120 in a couple of years. So not only would you let this guy 100%, you wouldn't charge an interest for two years. Now, neither Canada, nor Australia, nor anywhere, nor China, nor India, none of them uh, without um, high ratios against property. That's what I'm saying. I mean, that that, that was one of the financial, uh, the, the financial role of the central bank was basically somehow to prevent. I, but I mentioned, I said they didn't use prudential rules that they had, that they could have used. Okay, the second question was that uh, when you have these constant bailouts that that's happening without any punitive consequences, it doesn't that, that does not that encourage irresponsible behavior. I mean, you have these constant bailouts of all these banks that are happening now in, in Europe and America, but there was no punitive consequences of, of you know that sustainable growth was not being. I think you'd like to see Mr. Sadhguru say hung. I think what will satisfy you, satisfy you is that an investment banker is executed. Is that no, not not at all. What, what, what my <laughs> my concern is that every single just like for example, yeah, yeah. just for example, the CEO of a company, his performance, his pay, everything is linked to performance. Why can the investment bankers be rewarded on sustainable growth rather than just temporary tentative? Uh, bubble. So let me hear you, the, man, the right man to answer this question. <laughs> it's happening already. I, I have a question. Is, is, you gave the game away when you said you're a consultant. You see, the problem is, this is what most consultants are wannabe investment bankers. Now, if you are an investment banker, when somebody was paying you a bit of money, would you say no? Probably not. Probably not. Now let me tell you about the facts. Now let me tell you about the facts. During 2008, when the crisis struck, do you think investment bankers, by and large, walked away with everything they have earned over the last eight years? Uh, do you think so? Absolutely. If they didn't, then they did pay for it with their worth, net worth. Do you agree? I'm not sure about that. Okay. Yeah, but that was the point they lost was uh, there was a very small proportion of their total revenues. No, it was see, published, once it was published in the Time magazine, the various earnings by the top class investment bankers. Somebody may have lost maybe 10%, somebody may have lost 15%, but majority of the people, they lost more than 100% of their investment. You're absolutely wrong. I'm absolutely You're correct. completely wrong. Let, let me tell you, let me tell you something from investment, from absolutely the at the coal face, and then I'll hand it over to Salim. Do you know, remember a company called Lehman Brothers? Everybody remember Lehman Brothers? Yes. It kind of went bankrupt in 2008, do you remember that? 
70 to 80 percent of Lehman Brothers' compensation was earned by about 100 people in the company over the last eight years. 90% of that compensation over the last eight years was held in Lehman Brothers stock. 90% of that compensation was held in Lehman Brothers stock. When Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, they lost it all. Every single cent of it. Every single cent of it. So it is completely wrong to think that investment bankers didn't lose what they had earned. Now you can question, just one second, you can question how they were compensated and whether the met metrics used for compensation were appropriate or not appropriate. That's point number one. But you cannot question whether they lost their money or not. They did lose virtually all of their net worth in between 2008 and 2010. The next point is, what has done about fixing that? And my answer to you is nothing. And wait until the end of the session when I will explain why they've done nothing about it. Yeah, no, just to add to that, <coughs> if you were working with the Royal Bank, they did, you were paid it in share options. Not so much cash. Yes, there were some cash bonuses, but <coughs> the principal method of compensation was share, share options. Now, if you were Royal Bank of Scotland, your share price today is 5% of what it was. The options strike price would have been probably at 50%. Okay. So, I mean, you're quite out. Now, Citibank, your share price today is 3 now. Where I was, I wasn't an investment banker, but I did have some stock options at Citibank. It's now three and a half percent. In other words, look, look around. Uh, uh, yes, you take <coughs> Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs. You know, perhaps not as bad. J.P. Morgan, not as bad, but everywhere, options by the way are priced pretty close to what the market is at any one point. And uh, so, you know, the options are really just you know a few percent below the price of the time. Today, the price of every institution is way below the option price. Even J.P. Morgan, even Goldman Sachs, even Morgan Stanley. Not as bad as Citibank and Royal Bank of Scotland, but certainly you've lost your option. The option is worth zero. And if you had shares, you, uh, options, you uh, exercise your previous shares, you've lost a hell of a lot of money because you probably exercised your option. And for, I think for any major financial institution, at a higher price than the, what the price is now. So my name is Shabi Heather. I'm a faculty member of IBM. Uh, my question was that: I mean, if we, if the transactions between the countries were there in own uh, in their own currencies instead of a common currency of dollar, will it prevent the domino effect? You know, there's a, it's a it's a very good question. The trouble is, people talk. nobody look, look. The whole market knows that they they've entrusted their assets to the world's biggest debtor. And that's dangerous because you don't really want to be in a position where he goes very up because your debt will be worth half to the, the value of the currency in touch. The trouble is where do you take them? And where do you go? Until the Chinese open their markets, the Chinese <coughs> is still not an offshore market, so forget about the R&B. Uh, and it will be a while before the Chinese economy is big enough in international terms, <coughs> financial terms, globally. So that's not a serious order. Today you can't anyway. But the yen, all right, ten percent in the yen. Euro. What? The, what is the future of the euro? Which? Which? What do you end up holding? If you buy euro today, will it be drachmar, deutschmark, peseta? In case the euro unravels, so there is no option to the world. Salim sir, my name is Shabir Kazmi. I am an economic analyst. My question is that uh, all the countries have slightly different DNA composition. Whether you're talking about America, Spain, DNA composition, that means they have a different structure of their economy. They have got different problems. My question is, can we follow a blanket sort of a prescription which we can apply in USA, UK, France, Germany, Pakistan, India, or Nepal, or any other country. And second question is, you have worked for our central bank, that uh, one of the serious problems which central bank faces today is that it does not enjoy full autonomy what it was supposed to get no. according to the no, rules. The first, the first is about international DNA, the second is on Pakistan. Okay. Right? Would you say central bank doesn't uh, enjoy no, autonomy to be Pakistan? 
So my question was that uh, the solution which we can recommend for USA, Japan, Germany, France, uh, Greece, uh, they have to be slightly different than what we can suggest for Pakistan. Yes. Am I right? And second question was that uh, with reference to Pakistan, the, the central bank has not enjoyed the autonomy which it was supposed to get. Yeah. So on the first, I agree with you. <coughs> Countries have different dimensions, moving at different uh, paces, uh, influence affected by different factors, and you know, just generally, you can decide. You know, you can decide. You can decide what sort of level of taxation, what <coughs> types of encouragement. Uh, uh, what you want, I mean basically the decision is and you want employment up, you want more equality, less equality, you you want low taxes, is that going to produce growth for you or you want greater consum consumption, is that going to uh, <coughs> create growth for higher employment, the fair scars and all that. I mean those are, you know, there are guiding philosophies to all political planets. And let's leave that aside because that's not a meaningful question, you know, it will be dependent on the time. The pendulum swings. You know, the Reagan Thatcher revolution made sure we were all monetarists. Uh, the, uh, after the Great Depression, we were all Keynesian. In Europe in the 50s and 60s was Keynesian. Now all that was knocked out in the last 20 years. However, Keynes is there's a re-entry of Keynes. Now, as a philosophy, economic philosophy. So let's leave that aside. Pakistan autonomy in India, I mean it's I, all I can say is that you know autonomy. <coughs> Freedom is not restored. I mean, no, no system wants to lose control. Freedom is stated. So that's my only observation about the central. The central bank has to take its the state and pay for it exists. After that, it's up. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Usman. I want to ask you about what do you think about the recent interest rate cuts? And uh, well, there's a gentleman here who I shouldn't fear. Yeah, this, for this question, you need, like after the uh, oh. uh, like lunch break, you're gonna have. Look, I'll tell you just, you know, it, 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 just one line. If we have spare capacity in the economy, and if we have power, visually, to run those plants, then there is some logic to the argument that an interest rate cut will stimulate production, increase employment, and put us into growth. Now, if we don't have those, we may have spare capacity, if we don't have power and we can't fix it for the next several months, then the only benefit of that interest rate cut is that you, as depositors, subsidize the government of Pakistan to the extent of 120 billion rupees which is one and a half percent of eight trillion rupees of global currency debt. So if there's going to be a virtuous effect, it's got to be through productive capacity. And you know, I, I, so I, the state bank must have balanced that. <coughs> and perhaps they have news on power production that is not available to some of us, but I leave that to Dr. Mishtar to OK, I think that's 11 o'clock. I've taken my time. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> Like golf trophies, one of these things. Yes, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.